One of my favorite things to do on our Celebrating Appalachia channel is to talk about the wonderful language, accents, all those things, the words and phrases that people use in the mountains of Appalachia. I'm just plum foolish about it. Today, since now Matt's uh, working with me every day, he's gonna he's gonna come along. This is gonna be the first. I think we did do one video though back in the winter where we read out of the big book. It's what people some people call it. But anyway, Matt's gonna be with me today to share his thoughts and experiences with the words. We're getting towards the end of the dictionary. Of course, we've not shared every word in the dictionary. I've kind of just skipped over some and and shared others. But this is the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English is what we've used for reference. We're getting towards the end, so the entries get shorter uh, as you go through the alphabet, just like with any other kind of words. This book is very expensive, but if you look for the Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English, it's produced, published by the same, same people, same Michael Montgomery, his work, and then also his um, dear friend and the person that after he passed away seen it to make sure that it all actually got published jennifer and i'm sorry her last name escapes me at the moment but anyway you can find it it's much cheaper option and has has many of the same words in including others anyway you ready i'm ready you ready so we're going we're in the letter v's the letter v and then w today is the two that we're going to share uh, as i said not every word in the dictionary but just some of them so I think the first one was Vaunty. Vaunty. I've never heard that. Have you? No. Never heard it. And it means uh, boastful or vain. So I always, we're always interested if you'll leave a comment and tell us which words you've heard or you're familiar with. So maybe you've heard that one. Vaunty. That's a good one, though. I should remember to say that one. Vaunty. You're acting Vaunty today. I don't know. Vaunty. It almost sounds too proper. A little bit a little too proper for the holler here, yeah. I believe. This next one's interesting. It's veil, like you think of a bride in her veil, but it's actually, an, it's a noun, a call. The person born with this reputedly has the capacity to see ghosts and exercise other powers. I've heard that my whole life, that people, have you ever heard that? No. No. So I've heard that. Um, old piece of folklore it just means that sometimes and it's very very rare children are born when baby is born it still has part of the sack or whatever over its face for you know and then they remove it and I, i've heard that my whole life that anybody that's born like that has some kind of special powers maybe they're they can see into the future or or something like that maybe they can take off remove warts or or take the fire out of a barn uh, but I've never known anyone that actually had that happen to. So it says 1959, Hall Collection, Newport, Tennessee. Mother was born with a veil over her face, and she could tell you when something was a going to happen. When mother said something was a going to happen, you better not go. And that was Lori Hans. So the same way saying that because they thought because she was born with a, a veil or the call over her face, she could foresee the future, I guess. I believe that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. There's all kinds of strange folklore in Appalachia like that. Yeah. For sure. The next one is a velvet plant. I've never heard of that either, but then when I read the diction or the entry to see what it is, I have heard of the, the plant. Is this the common mullen, a tall biennial wild plant from which a tea is made having medicinal properties, same as feltwort and flannel leaf. And then, let's see, of its many local names, the ones like flannel leaf, velvet plant, and feltwort refer to its exceptionally dense wooliness. This is the first year that we've grew mullen. It grows wild. I see it on the sides of the roads everywhere I go, but none grow right here at our house in this mountain holler. So I bought some this year and I've got it growing. And in my, I didn't, I don't know much about it. Obviously it's the first year I've ever grew it. But in my last uh, video that I showed how it was progressing, I said, but it's not bloomed this year. And so many of you were kind enough to tell me about it that it doesn't, it'll, it'll be next year before it blooms. So hopefully next year it'll bloom and spread its seeds and we'll have more um, mullen or velvet plant. It is so soft. It, it looks like velvet. It feels like velvet for sure, but mm -hmm. we're interested in those medicinal properties is what we're interested in. 
The next entry is interesting. Uh, it's one I've never heard of either, but vertigris, a variant form, Barty Grease, Barty Grease. Have you ever heard of that one? It says, in liquor making, a poison that is produced by the action of acid on copper and must be filtered out. I've heard of that. Have you? I, I don't never recall heard of actually that word, but I know that uh, I'm familiar with the the poison and it's in, in the homemade liquor and you got to get rid of it and get it get it worked off and throw it away is that what if you talk about people that made moonshine they made bad and give you people they called it jake leg or something yeah. make you sick yeah. yeah so let's see 1956 hall collection del rio tennessee vortigrease comes from the copper steel it comes from the pot ordinarily which is very poisonous fred metcalf you had a rag and put fire coals in there and strain it through them fire coals, take the vorta grease off, and that was Taylor Sutton. 1976, Carter, Little Tree. Where it comes out, we had hickory coals to strain off the barty grease, which would make you sick if you drank it. It'll Interesting. All, it'll all make you sick if you drink it. Well, that's true. <laughs> I guess not near as many people making it today, so maybe that's why that one has right. fallen right. out of fashion, but right. I've never heard it. The next one is verm, verminous, verminous, a variant form is verminous, wild, malicious, having the quality of a varmint, foul with vermin. I've never heard that one. I don't think I have either. Traps is good for them, hunts, uh, hunts rabbits, and rabbit hunting is good for boys, but for me, give me old, my old flintlock shooting iron and let a keen pack of lean hounds be hopping on ahead, and of all sports, the master sport is following their music over the mountains and winding up with bullet or sticker, a varminous old bar. A bar. <laughs> a bar. Yeah. And that was 1883 Ziegler. I guess you like that one, though, don't oh, yeah. you? Oh, yeah. Like, you I like, like to? I like to hear that, that old... Uh, descriptive talk that you don't hear anymore yeah. that, that kind of tickles me you've been uh, having some varminous old bars yeah. up there on the in Matt's hunting yeah perform. disturbing his hunting this year uh, yeah this it, next one is uh, an interesting one is vittle so it's spelled v-i-c-t-u-a-l and then it says a variant form spelled you could spell it vittle v-i-t-t-l-e food for a meal 1867, uh, Harris Loving Good. Now the smashing of Delph and the mixing one's vittles begun. They were, I guess, I don't know, they were having a party maybe and they were gonna, they were gonna eat some. Ad would make me or Amy one fetch, fetch his vittles for him. 1960 Hall Collection. Now you take up the vittles and I'll wash the dishes. That was Levada Palmer Sisk. Mountain talk, food or vittles. I hope Ma's got the vittles on when I get home. And then Montgomery Collection, 1997. I come along for the vittles. And then it could be a verb to eat a meal. Have you already vittled? I've never heard that. Have you already <laughs> no, vittled? I like it. No. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So I have a, a funny story about vittles. One time I was supposed to, I was going to actually speak at a, a little festival, not really a festival, more like a conference about food, Southern Appalachian foodways. And Ronnie Lundy, which is a wonderful writer and uh, cookbook author and very sweet lady too, I got to meet her that weekend. She, she was going to be there and she had her new book, which was Vittles. And before uh, I was just about to leave, maybe the day or so before, to go to the conference. They called and asked me if I'd be willing to go to the local TV station and talk, like give a blurb about the event. And I said yes. And they said, well, they would want me to talk about her, her new book. So, I, of course, they told me the name of it. And then I looked up. So I thought, well, what are they going to ask? I've never been on TV. What are they going to ask me to say? But then I got to worrying about it. And I thought, well, I would say that vittles. You know, I need to make sure. So I messaged the people back and said, you know, just so I pronounce the name of the book right, how do you, how would you pronounce it? So they wrote back that I should pronounce it victuals, victuals. 
and I thought that just cannot be right. I know Ronnie's cookbooks in the past, and she would she would name it Vittles, has to be. And uh, but I thought, well, gosh, what do I do? I don't want to go on TV and say something stupid, you know. Either way, offend her or be, look stupid. Yeah. So finally, I figured. I thought, I wonder if she's. I think I was on on Facebook, and I went and found her, and then I messaged her and told her and introduced myself and told her, and she laughed and she said, No, it's Vittles. You need to say Vittles. So yeah. I was like. <laughs> Thank goodness I didn't listen to the TV people there. Uh, so that is, we, you hear that one fairly often, just yeah. more in a joking manner. Yeah, I've heard victuals before. Yeah, have you? I've actually used it. Victuals, to be silly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like Papa and his, uh, what does he say, for um, hors d'oeuvres? Hortivores. Hortivores, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, vigorous is the next one, vigorous. Vigorous is a variant. I've not heard that one, but it's interesting. This one, I think of vigorous, of course, like strong, and you might hear someone say that a, whether it's an animal or a child or something, they're growing vigorous, or maybe it's a plant. The corn's growing vigorous, or a vine that's real vigorous. I can't kill it. It's so vigorous. But this says an adjective. It's an adjective. Vicious, testy, and out of sorts. Have you ever heard it used like that? Vigorous. I don't think so. I don't think I have. 1928, he's always making out like he's terrible, vigorous feller, but he ain't. Why, he's just as soft-hearted as a gal. So he's just as soft-hearted, soft-hearted as a gal. So he's making out like he's vigorous. So I've never heard it, heard it used like that. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. The panther was so vigorous and mad, it took each piece and tore it up. Oh, goodness. She's tore all her clothes off and finally made it home, start naked. <laughs> so she was barely escaped the panther, the vigorous panther, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That had been a scary one. That was Charlie Palmer. Yeah, that'd be bad. That was in the Hall Collection. That was from Waynesville, your old stomping grounds. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting usage for that one. Here's one that I say a lot, and sometimes people, I've had often people ask me what I mean, what I'm talking about, but as a volunteer, noun, a self-growing plant or crop of vegetables or grain that comes up from old seed, either late in the season or in the spring. 1966-68, a crop that springs up and grows by itself from old seed, and that was known in Burnsville, Spruce Pine, and Gatlinburg. Uh, and then it goes on to tell some other counties where it was known. So that's one that I've heard my whole life. Have you volunteer? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And it's a, I'm always and I talk when I talk about volunteers, I'm almost always saying they amaze me because the seed probably right now me and Matt have left some seeds scattered around. Either it's dropped from our tomatoes this summer, or maybe we dropped a bean. You know, as we were picking beans, a seed dropped or something. Maybe a pumpkin, one that went bad, just laid there and decomposed, or a watermelon or something. Next year, it'll lay there all winter. Maybe it'll snow, if I'm lucky, <laughs> be under the snow. We'll put more compost on it. We might scratch out, you know, around it while we're cleaning up. So, it'll, in other words, it won't be taken care of, taken care of at all. And then next year, it will sprout and grow and do better, likely, than the ones we plant. It's because it's vigorous. Yeah, it's because it's vigorous. That's right. Yeah, because yeah. it's vigorous. Yeah. So they're, they're a little more vigorous than the, the ones you actually planted. Yeah, they're stronger. Mm -hmm. I always say I want to test and like plant my plant a whole bed. Go ahead and plant it. Like not now because it would sprout. When would you have to do that? Like maybe first of November. Yeah. And then just leave it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Let's try that. Okay. Will you remind me? Okay. I mean, we can't plant the whole garden, but do one little bed. Okay. Plant a tomato and a um, uh, squash or yeah, something. We can do it, but the problem is, will we remember it? <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll, have we'll to, plant over top of it and forget it. We'll have to make a big mark or something. Uh, the next one is vomit, but the variant form you hear often in Appalachia is vomic with a you add a C, turn it into a C. Vomic. You heard that one, I know. Mm -hmm. Heard that one my whole life. I was vomiting. Yeah, I've heard my daddy say that one. Yeah. I always thought he was making a joke out of the word, but actually it's a real word. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a real usage common, yeah. yeah. Probably how he learned it from his parents. Yeah. Uh, I always think of, uh, when I think about any kind of, th we just say throw up most of the time, we don't say vomit. 
or vomit, either one, but a, a girl that I worked with, her daughter would say when she was, she was little and like the first time maybe she was ever sick and didn't exactly know what was happening, she would say, oh no, mama, I'm about to spill again. I'm about to spill. It's like, I thought that was so cute. That's how she described it. Yep. One time when, one of the first times, well, I guess it's maybe the second time or something, because Katie was a little bit older, but uh, she was sick with stomach virus. And actually, Katie had it and I had it and Corey had it. Matt did not have it. So what did Matt get to do? He got to take care of all of us. And we had this, like a pallet in the living room. I was on the couch and Corey and Katie was on the pallet. And uh, of course we had buckets for them to, you know, when it's that kind of stomach virus, it just comes over and over. But Katie didn't go in the bucket. So then once again, Matt had to change the whole bed and do all that. And he was kind of fussing at her, telling her she had to. And uh, it's just one of the funniest memories in our family. She never even raised up, but she put her little hand up in the air and said, I'd be ashamed. I'm just a little child. I'm just five years old. <laughs> so she was saying, telling him not to get on to her. Well, she went to the bucket. And went and beside, it. beside it. Yeah, something. She was, she was scared of the bucket. Yeah, something. Somehow or another. And she was like, I, I can see her little hand like, I was just five years just old. I'm just child. a little child. Yeah. I'd be ashamed. Mm -hmm. She was always telling me and Matt she'd be ashamed yeah. if she was us for getting when she was in trouble. Yeah. Well, she wasn't in trouble then, but. Yeah. Well, she still does that. <laughs> Tells me I'll be ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Okay, we'll go on to the W's. A waste. Have you ever heard of a waste other than your waste, of course? I've heard older women use this one and then also read it in like old books where uh, uh, accounts of long ago. But it was a shirt or vest like garment, especially one for a woman that comes to the waist and is worn with a skirt and a blouse, same as a shirt waist. Yeah, I don't know that yeah, one. Yeah, Matt don't know that one. This next one is really interesting. I've never heard this usage either or never even knew about this, but I found it fascinating. So it's a waiter. You think, well, we all know what a waiter is today. But it was a wedding attendant, especially the best man or maid of honor. 1936, it was known in Madison County, Swain County, North Carolina. And then 1939, the Hall Collection, Emirates Cove, Tennessee, the gentleman that would sit by the side of the one that was a-going to be married, they would be a lady sit by the side of the woman that was a-going to be married. That was called the waiters, and that was um, Le Leona Stennett. That was called the waiters. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Makes you think maybe they were just sitting there waiting or like, uh, what is it from the palace days, the castles, lady in waiting or whatever? Oh, yeah, I guess I don't that's know. the drive from that same thing. Yeah, but I've never, ever heard that. Wait on, wait on, just a verb phrase, to court a woman. I've never heard it used like that for courting, wait mm -hmm. on. Mm -mm. And then to wait for, well, of course, that makes sense to us. Deep Creek, North Carolina, I was supposed to wait on this fellow at the forks of the creek where we heard the dogs barking when I left him, and that was Mark Cathy. I would, I would say that exactly the same way. Yep. This is one of those that's uh, really interesting to me because it makes me wonder why it's even in the dictionary because that's what I would say, wait on. I would never say wait for, I would just say wait on. I mm -hmm. guess that would be the opposite. That's what other people would say, wait for. Yeah. But I would say, wait on me, I'm coming. Yeah. What? Wait on Dad, he'll be here in a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we well, have used that all my life. Yeah, Granny, wait on me, I'll mm -hmm. be down there in a in a few minutes. So you'll have to tell us if that's one that that you're familiar with. Another interesting one. The next one is wake. Well, you know what a wake is, I'm sure. An all night vigil held at the home of a deceased person before the burial. The occasion is often a time of socializing and family reunion. According to the consultants, the common mountain term for this event is setting up. Most consultants say that wake is used by outsiders or in a, is a book term rarely, if ever, used by mountain people. So when I first saw that entry, that's exactly what I thought. I thought, well, I know they're probably talking about setting up with the dead, but I've never heard nobody call that a wake. No, no, I mean it's 
I mean, I'm uh, familiar with wake and know what it is, but just uh, here around here, it would be called setting up. Yeah, yeah. Setting up with the dead yeah. or, you know. And it's not done much. I mean, a little bit still, but yeah. I've never, it's just not a common usage in this area as, as wake, and it may have been at one time, but it's not now. No, it's not. I don't think it ever <coughs> really has been. Yeah. When you read through the entry, and it's a big, long entry, all the, it's really all kind of like what it just said there. It's kind of outside people or, or even local people trying to explain what it is, and then they put wake in, in quotation marks, like right. awake, so you would understand. So not many people today do that, as in the old days. No. In my lifetime, though, two of one of Granny's sisters and one of Granny's brothers was they did that with. Um, so Granny's family still observed that. I'm trying to remember a good grief. How can I not remember? Was Granny Gazzy? I don't guess she was. I was pregnant with Corey and Katie, but maybe they didn't do that for no, her. Or maybe they it. did, though. I remember being at her house. I think they did. Yes, I think she was there, too. So I remember standing in the yard. When I was pregnant with Corey and Katie, my grandmother, Gazzy, died, and then Matt's grandmother, Laura, died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, Granny's family still observed it in, the, in my lifetime, but not today. Not today. It'd be interesting if you uh, live in Appalachia or wherever you live to tell us if is that something that your family or your people still observe is sitting up with the dead. Wallow is the next one. You wouldn't say wallow. What would you say? Waller. Waller. Yeah, we would say waller. Uh, it says a sunken area of land, especially one where animals such as bears or wild hogs dust themselves. I thought they also like wallowed in the mud. I do. Yeah, is that what dust themselves mean? No. No, it's um, something different. I no. mean, I know like the chickens dust themselves. Yeah, but chickens and birds and stuff. I don't know. Maybe they're just phrasing it like that, yeah. and it meant waller in the mud. Yeah. No idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we would use like that if what uh, some places are named that like bear waller and, and hog waller. Yeah, where animals where they out in the woods, it's a right. damp place, and you can see where animals have done that. Or you use it like uh, somebody being nasty as a hog waller. Yeah, and then we would also use it like um, if Matt and <laughs> I don't know why you would, but if you got down on the ground there and rolled around, I'd say, well, he's just wallering all over the ground. I can do it. If you well, want go to. ahead and show well, us. That's a little wet. Yeah. It's a heavy dew this morning. Yeah. You get wet. We might say it even like um, if I was trying to, I think I did use it the other day in something I was trying to do, maybe even in a video, and I was trying to put something in a in a jar or pan or something, and I and then I couldn't get it to go in, and I was like, I've wallered it all over the place, you mm -hmm. know, probably. Yeah, I've used so, that. Yeah. That one's an interesting one. A wampus cat. Have you ever heard of a wampus cat? Yep. I had really never heard of the wampus cat until I started researching, like, for the blind pig and the acorn. I, but growing up, that was not one I ever heard of. But it's a large, imaginary, cat-like creature that is the subject of folk stories and used to admonish children to behave. Is that how you heard it, or you just heard stories? Yeah, I've I, heard it used that way, yeah. Imagine, oh, let's see, let's see if we can find a, a, well, a variant form of it is a wampus, wampus instead of cat wampus. Wampus, wampus cat, well, that is it. Oh, it's just spelling it different, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's me not being able to read a dictionary. <clears throat> okay, there's a wampus using around here. That was in Maryville, Tennessee. 1980 Brewer, it's getting both. East Tennessee and the Ozarks have had wampus cats, bloodthirsty critters that usually are more rumor than truth. 1984, the wampus cat is probably one of the most unusual legends to come out of Sevier County. The wampus cat was supposed to be a black shaggy haired thing about the size of a dog with a long pointed nose that glowed like a cigar. The wampus cat could stand on its hind legs and was also a nuisance to lone riders on deserted roads. It was said that the wampus cat could jump out of an overhanging tree onto the back of the horse, pulling the weary traveler's buggy and scare the horse into a panic. Not only was the wampus cat a nuisance, it is said to be indestructible. Every farmer or hunter who shot at it claimed its fur repelled the bullets as a duck's feather repels water. Huh. That sounds like a 
you might see a wampus cat. You better you better not go hunting <clears throat> anymore. Yeah, it sounds like a whole lot of something that ain't true to me. <laughs> wampus cat. Yeah. There's other ones. What's some of the other ones? Uh, the Mothman. Yeah. I didn't hear about that one. Well, I think that was before because we had friends that used to talk yeah. about the Mothman. So, yeah. but that they introduced us to the Mothman and. Yeah. There's there's several like that mm -hmm. legends. About yeah. to get that time of the year when people tell spooky tales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next one, the one we'll end on today, is interesting. It's it's. I guess the best way to say it is I don't really understand what the dictionary is saying about it because, of course, grammar is not my strong suit or sentence structure or anything like that. You've probably probably already figured that out about us. But it is interesting that we use all the usages that it talks about. So that's the part that I really like. But I will read you what it says. So want, the verb, W-A-N-T. The first entry is says, with ellipsis of following that, with a dependent clause as object of the verb. So if you understand what that means. And then, <laughs> me neither. And then some of the examples are, 1928, child, I want you should think about it all your days. And then we'll go all the way to 1975, Chalm Chalmers, better. Pink's wife, Pink's wife's been took bad, and Doc wants you should come and help him. So that's exactly how we would say those, yep. wants. Well, not yeah. wants. With no, S, but I mean want, but, but, but that, won't. Yeah. 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 We would use it in that same way. I want you. Yeah, I want you to come up here and help me. Whatever. Yeah, I wouldn't say ye, right? Yeah. But I would say I want you right. to to help me do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've said that all my life, and always, probably still, yeah. forever I will. I might even say I want Yuns to help me yeah, do I this. I want you to help me, or yeah. I want you to go to town, or right. Yeah. So we do that one. Then the second one is plus preposition with elliptical infinite as in phrases won't in and won't off etc let's see let's go to one all the way to 1956 some dial north carolina uh, well that's not a good one because it don't give a sentence oh yeah it does that dog doesn't know whether he wants in or out mm -hmm. yeah don't know whether he wants in or out no. i want in i want in Mm -hmm. I want out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially little kids. Right. I want in. I want out. Yeah, I'm familiar with all of. Olive always wants out. Yep, she yeah. does. She always wants whatever she ain't got. <laughs> yeah. Wants whatever you've got in your hand, and she ain't supposed to have it. Mm. So then they say um, speakers used in construction, such as those examples, were from East Tennessee. Well, we're real close to East Tennessee, so that one, yes, we do that too. Number three is plus past participle with elliptical infinitive as in phrase won't done. And then the example is 1939 Hall Collection, Catalucci, North Carolina. We set it on the fire and put our meat in it, our beans, or anything we wanted boiled. 1999 McNeil, Purchase Knob, just tell me what you want done. Mm -hmm. Again. Yeah. That's what Matt's been saying to me since he's been working with me. Just tell me what you want done and I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. So that one again, very, I don't mm -hmm. know how else I would say that. Yeah. I don't know how else to say it. Okay, and the last one for that entry, four, as a progressive verb. 1939 Hall Collection, was you wanting to go to town? What was you wanting to say? Polite request to repeat something, not heard. I'm wanting to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Again, we would say, I don't know how else, we would say all of those. It's common language yeah, for us. Yeah. So well, I guess the dictionary is pointing it out is those, it's unusually grammatically, it's what I take from all that stuff that I don't understand exactly. Yeah, there's some big words up there. <laughs> we need to look up them words <laughs> yeah, and try to figure out what they mean. We need to get a regular dictionary. Yeah. Well, they're all about the grammar, which, like I said, if you've listened to us any length of time, you've done and realized we're not about the grammar. Not at all. We're just about communicating. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting for all the words and phrases, but especially like that last one, tell us, is that exactly what you would say too? And maybe tell us, you know, are you in Appalachia or maybe you're in California or New York or Florida or wherever. 
be interesting to see if those usages. And we have a lot of viewers from overseas, from uh, Europe, whether it's England or Ireland, Scotland, wherever, wherever you're at, uh, leave that too if, if that usage is common there. And as for me, I'm always going to be wanting to talk about Appalachia and the way people speak that live here. I'm always going to be wanting to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I never get tired of it. I never get tired of listening to uh, people, you know, when I'm just sitting back listening to conversations, seeing what jumps out at me. Even people that don't sound like us, I, I hear certain little, you know, whether they're adding a T here or there, it's just fascinating to me. I think mm -hmm. all, all the way all people talk is fascinating, but of course, since I live here, this is the Appalachian accent is definitely what's near and dear to my heart.